So we're in a series on living in the tree of life. It's taken, the basis is taken from the Garden of Eden, and in the center of the garden, there was the tree of life, and there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There were two trees. Thank you, Corey Thomas, for bringing that forward last week. There were two trees. The tree, living in the tree of life, is a picture of God is in the center. He's the center. Jesus is God, and he is the revelation of who God is and what he wants to be in our lives. He's the uniter of our lives to be what we're supposed to be. So living in the tree of life is living in the person of Jesus Christ, that he is our life. So this morning, would you follow along with me? There's some verses right here. Jesus was speaking, and it says, then Jesus, then. Why don't you circle then, and sometime later you can look and say, what was the then, then for? And why did he say then? Because something happened before he said then, and you want to find out what the then is then for. Therefore, you can know what he's saying then for. You get it? It's really strategic, too, because Jesus said some then right before then. It said, anyway. Then Jesus said to the crowd, this is 2,000 years ago, recorded his words. We're a crowd this morning. May Jesus be saying this to us. Then Jesus said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, if any of you wants to, Jesus never forces himself, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must put aside your selfish ambition Selfish ambition, that basically means that my life and my wants are not the center of my life. I'm not the number one priority. My selfish, put aside your selfish ambition, shoulder your cross daily and follow me and follow me. So you must put aside, you must take up your cross, you must, if you want to follow Jesus, if you try to keep your life for yourself, everybody say keep. How many want to keep your life? Yeah. If you try to keep your life for yourself, for yourself, you will lose. You will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, who's me? Jesus. You will what? Find true life. Living in the tree of life. Find true life. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it one way or another, sooner or later. If you will lose your life for Jesus' sake and for his good news, then you will find... What will you find? In the, word, in the Bible, there's several... There's lots of words. In fact... Uh, in the original language is about 11,000 different words. But uh, the number of times a word is in the Bible, the word believe is approximately 272 times in one form or another in this book. Believe. Have faith in God. Believe in God. The word pray. How many believe in praying? Prayer. Prayer. Prayer, prayer is just asking God. Just making your request. The number one rule in the kingdom of heaven is to ask, is to ask. So that's pray, 371 times, pray. The word love, <clears throat> we're starting to build up here, the word love is in the Bible uh, 733 times. The word give is in this book approximately 2,162 times. The word give. Everybody say give. How many like it when the other person's doing the giving? So turn to the person next to you and say, give. And that's what Jesus said. If you want to find true life, you must give your life. You must give. So everybody say, give, one more time. Yeah. And I, uh, I love it because my human nature, my, I stick myself in the center, not the tree of life. I'm in the middle, and I go, I hope you give. You know, you need to give. I don't know what their problem is. They got to give. So uh, if you want real life, you give. Jim Elliott was one of five missionaries that was killed in Central America in January of 1956. They were trying to reach a small tribe of 70 people. And these five young fathers all died that day. Landed their plane in the, in a, uh, right off a riverbank there and trying to reach out to an, a people group in Central America that nobody had ever shared about Jesus with them, and they were trying to build a bridge. 
They were trying to connect and make a relationship, and that day, all five of those men were killed. It was considered a tragedy. It was, the news reported it, um, and one of the men, his name is Jim Elliott, he said this before he died. He wrote this down. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And uh, his wife from 50 plus years ago, she's written a lot of books. Her name is Elizabeth Elliot, and she's still having a great influence today. We would say, what a, what a loss. Five young men all lost their life that day. We have no idea the number of people that have put their trust in Jesus because of these five martyrs for Jesus. He is no fool, Jim Elliott said, who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. So what is the key to life? The key to life, that's what we're emphasizing. We've read these verses about denying yourself. All that kind of, the key to life is giving for Jesus. Giving for Jesus. Giving for Jesus. If you will give your life for Jesus, he says, you will find real life. Because you'll find what you're living for. You'll find your purpose in life. So why does God want me to give? Let me, I just thought I'd give you a quick underlining before we worship. At the end, we're going to worship by a, an expression of our faith this morning. But uh, let me just give you seven benefits of giving your life away. The word giving, if, uh, if I were to guess, most of us in this room would say as soon as a, a pastor like me stands up and says the word give, what is the first word that comes to your mind? Money. Everybody say money. You know, money. Say money. How many like money? Two of us love money. Oh, this is a great message. I guarantee it. Money. But giving is all-encompassing. Giving is all... So here's seven benefits to giving. Number one, giving makes me more like my God. Makes me more like my maker. Giving makes me more like God. God loved the people of this world so much that he gave his only son. So when I give... I become more like my creator, who his whole attitude, because of who he is, is giving. He's a giver. God's a giver. When I'm a giver, I, rep, I reveal my father, what my father's really like. I uh, send a text every once in a while to my daughter when, you know, on occasion, and I will put at the bottom of my text, uh, sincerely, your earthly father. Because I want to emphasize the one who does all the giving, and I want to emphasize the one who was the perfect father, is my father in heaven. I'm just the earthly father. And so he did the giving, and then he says, if you give, you'll be like me. You won't be God, but you'll be like me. You will be godly. So giving makes me more like my God. Number two, giving draws me closer to God. Giving draws me closer to God. In the message, it says, stockpile treasure in heaven. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is is the place you will most want to be and end up being. I like that. So stockpile your treasures in heaven. Giving draws me closer to God. Have you noticed that whatever you invest yourself in, time or your money or wherever you invest, that's what gets your attention? That's what... You're drawn to. So giving makes me more like God. Giving draws me closer to God. Giving is the antidote to, uh, I don't know how it turned out on your outline, but giving is the antidote to materialism. Ism. The isms will get you every time. Giving is the antidote to materialism. How many here have a car or a motorcycle or a boat? And you own it. I mean, it's yours. I mean, you may be making payments on it, but you own it. How many if somebody opens up their car door in the parking lot against your car, it makes you cringe a little bit? Why? Because you, that's your car. That's where you're, you're kind of like, ah! And how many know it's just 
a car. And Manuel Rodriguez, he can fix it too. <laughs> or whoever, whatever body shop you want. I, I, I'm keeping Manuel in business these days. But uh, we get caught up on focused on the things, the things. Now, how many enjoy things? Can I see your hand? How many enjoy? How many here enjoy having a flat screen TV? I'm coveting your screen right now. Your TV is. I, how many enjoy a high definition TV? How many get that? Oh, uh, there, and I, man, I love it. I just invite me over so I can watch it, and uh, that's good. How many know uh, that in America we have a lot? Now, don't go, oh, I feel guilty for having so much. That's not the way, that's not the God of the Bible. He blessed you. He blessed you. Isn't it amazing? We can have a lot. We can have our jobs going well. Things are running good. And we go, oh, isn't it great? And we don't think about God. And then things go down. We don't have, a, we don't have income. They go, God, what have you done to me? We, we didn't think of him too much when we had all that we needed. Now that we're under, what have you done to me? Because we tend to put our trust in the things around us. Tell those that are rich in this world's wealth to quit being so obsessed with money, which is so easily lost. Tell them to have faith in God who richly gives. Would you circle that? Who richly gives. The reason America is the most prosperous nation in the history of the planet is because God has richly blessed us. Because God has given to us. Whether anybody acknowledges it, it doesn't matter. God is the source, and he's richly blessed us. He has richly blessed us. He gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Circle enjoyment. How many enjoy? How many have a smartphone? How many enjoy your smartphone? See, and, oh, I feel bad. I enjoy my smartphone so much. Enjoy it. God made it. He made it possible. You got your smartphone. How many got your iPad? How many got your third generation iPad and it's overheating on you now? <laughs> Enjoy. Tell people to use their money to do good, to be rich in doing good deeds, to be generous and ready to share. And if they do this, they'll build a treasury that will last, gaining life that is truly life. Giving and sending life, true life, true life. Number four, fourth benefit of giving, giving strengthens my faith in God. How many here desire to have more faith in God? This is one way when we give in some measure, when we give, not just money, but money ties it all kind of together because money is such the, the, the language of our day. It give, giving strengthens my faith in God. Give and it, you will receive. You'll be given much. The way you give to others is the way God will give to you. Giving strengthens my faith in God. A fifth benefit of giving. Giving is the only safe investment. Ray gave the illustration earlier. Case closed. It's the only safe investment. By doing this, what is he's talking about giving? By giving, you will be storing up real treasure for yourselves in heaven. It is the only safe investment. First Timothy 6 in the Living Bible. Matthew 6, these are the words of Jesus. He said, store up for yourselves. I want you to circle the word for yourselves. There's kind of like sometimes an idea going around that you're not doing anything for, you can't do anything. It's just, Jesus said, store up for yourselves. Our problem becomes where we're doing the storing. How many have us, don't, don't raise your hand. How many uh, can't get the car in the garage? How many need a storage unit? Now, man, we, we can't even enjoy all the stuff we got. Right? Is that right? True? And it's all right. It's just that it's not safe. Store for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust, I almost put termites there, <laughs> and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. 
Number six, the sixth benefit for giving. Giving gives me blessing. I get more blessing. When I give, I am blessed. When I give for Jesus' sake, generous people will be blessed. Proverbs 22, 9. The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Those who give to others will themselves be helped. And then uh, there's this story in Mark chapter 10. You should go back and read it real quickly. But Peter is challenging Jesus. He's walking along with Jesus. And he said the question all of you would say, uh, if you'd have been there 2,000 years ago. But uh, Peter says, hey, Jesus, we've given up everything to follow you. What's going to happen to us? Now, you need to go back and read where this story is. We call it the rich young ruler, the rich young man. And he came saying, how do I find eternal life? And Jesus went through the questions and said, it's going to be really tough for rich people. And, and uh, the guys said, Jesus, then who can, be, who can have eternal life? And with man, everything's impossible. With God, all things are possible. And then Peter turns to Jesus and said, Jesus, we've left everything to follow you. If any of you want to be my follower." You must give, give up, surrender. That's the worship word, surrender. So, Jesus said this. I assure you that everyone who has given up, everybody say give up. Everyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news, who are you doing the giving for? For Jesus' sake and for the good news, will be given in this life a hundred times as many houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and property. I noticed in the second list, fathers got left out. Along with being mistreated. You can give everything to Jesus and trust me, you're still going to have trouble in this life. Along with persecutions. And in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. You give up, Jesus gives more than abundance. It's going to work out. How many in this church, you're not just a part of the crowd, but you're connected as a friend to other people in this church because of the person of Jesus. And that friend, I'm not talking about an obligated family member, you know, well, I have to take care of them, they're family. I'm talking about because of a spiritual connection, because Jesus has brought us together, somebody else in this church family has given to you in a way that's blessed your life, and you, didn't, you wouldn't have pictured it without Jesus between us. At least a half dozen of us. The kingdom is on the move. I sat this week with uh, two 80-somethings, octogenarians, one of the men had invited me to the lunch, and Daniel, my son, shows up and before I was leaving and said, hey, you want to go to lunch? So I said, hey, come on. I just had a couple of older guys invite me to lunch. And uh, so I was invited to lunch because over 20 years ago, I met this man, and we're friends in Jesus, and he invites me to lunch. And so uh, I brought Daniel. I said, hey, we'll get two, two lunches out of this. And uh, that was really cool because he invited me, and then my father-in-law was the other guy there, and he paid. So uh, that was good. That's good. It all works out. It all works out. Listen, God will take care of us, and he will bless our lives through each other. Number seven, giving brings me greater joy. Remember, the master said, you're far happier giving than getting. So, in conclusion, I just wanted to try and tell you a few stories. We live in America in the 21st century. We are very busy and we have lots of things that keep us going. And here's some names on a piece of paper. I just want you to know that over the last, since 1966, this church family have give, has given well over $3 million away for the cause of Christ around the world. Now, that doesn't count what's been given here in our community. In some way, 
that we could demonstrate the concrete faith we have in the eternal God. So, in the last eight months, believe it or not, I, I was kind of looking since the fall of 08. How many know that the quote-unquote economy kind of tanked in the fall of 08? And now we're in recovery. <laughs> How many wish we'd have a little more recovery? <laughs> you got the idea. In the last eight months, the people sitting among you have given, on average, over $12,000 a month in the last eight months. We take those offerings that come in and we give them to support missionaries and mission projects around the world. That's how we, on a monthly basis, as we by faith give our offerings, then we give about $8,000. We've said, as God would provide for us, we will give to help these families overseas. Here's three of our families. Ray mentioned one of them, maybe both of them. The Austin family, for instance, They've been in the country of Tajikistan. Does anybody know where Tajikistan is? It's somewhere out there. And 15 years ago or so, Tim and Eve Austin took their young children, and uh, it, that's an old picture. They're on the left. Their family of five have been serving in a Muslim nation for these years. They're coming home to, for a while in May of this year, and hopefully they'll be a part of our church for a while. Their oldest, who is, can't really speak, but their oldest daughter, she's been going to Monta Vista this year, and uh, they're coming home for a rest. But they've been giving their lives and their time and their energy in the country of Tajikistan. Tahu? Why would they do that? Because of the reality of the person of Jesus in their lives, and then we are part of several churches that partner with them to help them get there. Does that make sense? So that's what our missions giving is all about. I just want to tell you for the people in the crowd that are wondering, I get no percentage on this. Did you get that? Like, this is not a sales program. Like, if you give a lot today, I get a, I'm getting a, I get a little off the top. I don't get a penny. And I don't say that as a, I'm just saying that as let's do it because we love Jesus. Let's give because these people love Jesus and we're changing people's lives. The Arzunis, um, we're not supposed to say, but they're somewhere up in the north and uh, east, west, northwest part of China, serving there with their small children. And they are remarkable people and they've got their small family of four there, serving, serving, serving. Uh, the Maddox family, they were with us last year. They're in the middle of India. In your planner, there is a family, the Dorsets, and they're in Southeast Asia as well. And Joanne Benson sent them an email and said, hey, could just kick back, tell us, is it worth giving for Jesus? Tell us, does it really matter? So it's, it's mom and dad and two children, David and Gail Dorset. we support them. And they're serving in Southeast Asia, and they sent back this email. This past year, this is in your planner, you can read along. This past year, we were able to go into a group of villages in a predominantly Muslim area. There is no church. In fact, there's no real Christ witness. There's no witness for Christ. We opened up a dental training clinic, and just after one, after one year, we saw a couple accept Christ as their Savior and Lord. Whatever we have given up pales in comparison, knowing that this young couple have given up absolutely everything to follow Jesus. And they would not have had that opportunity had we not answered God's call to give up the comforts of living in California. We asked our kids, Joe and David, how they felt about giving up Dunkin' Donuts, Krispy Kreme, Legos, and cousins living close by. And they said they remembered this young couple, as well as a little eight-year-old girl who had, ta had taken a book they had given them the legend of the three trees. And as a result, she and her mother accepted Jesus. Very quickly, Joe and David said they would give up much more than this to see it all happen again. Those are the kind of people I want to encourage, not only with my prayers, but with my offering, with my giving. And I want to invite you to join in with us as a church today. Wonderful.
Everybody take out, uh, if you would, uh, be willing, please take out a faith promise card. I want to explain it to you. Now, if you are just visiting today, I know um, Fred and Meredith, there's a lady here from Fred and Meredith Gateway Church. Uh, in, uh, and so, forget it. It's not for Bobby. And, uh, and if you're a guest with us today, you don't have to do this. This is not, but everybody here who wants to follow Jesus, I'm encouraging it, do something. This is a tradition we have as a church to give for the gospel of Jesus around the world. And in my giving, I find that God gives back to me life. And so um, you need to take this out and you need to read through it slowly. This is my mission's faith promise. As God enables me, I will help take the message of Jesus into all the world by giving through the missions program of my local church. That would be us. And then I I marked on there monthly faith promise, and I put down a number there that Deanne and I will give on a monthly basis. And this is renewing as God, and here's how it is. Uh, As God would provide, I'm believing, what what would God provide for us? And then give as God provides, and it all goes to support these missionaries. We call it missions giving, faith promise giving. Everything that comes out ultimately goes away, goes out. We're giving it all away. Because the key to living is what? Giving for Jesus. So I filled this out, put my name, Deanna's name. It's a signature. I signed it. And then uh, there's a little card there you can tear off. Now, I would like to invite, would you be willing to join with us Because we believe in Jesus, and we believe everybody in the world needs to hear about Jesus. Everybody in the world. And so if you today are a believer in Jesus, I want to invite everybody to join. This is just one way we give. This isn't the total way you give. How many here, and and I don't want to, uh, I just want to give you ideas. People say, I don't have any money to give to missions. By faith, what, how have you prospered and God could give through you? What could you believe God for? How many here love Jamba Juice, for instance? How many have never heard of Jamba Juice? How many here like coffee? How many have to have your coffee every day at Starbucks? And, uh, man, Starbucks, they must be multi, multi, they put stores next to stores, across from stores. And, uh, and I love Starbucks, a chai tea latte, and uh, chai tea. I like Starbucks. Let me see, uh, Nicole would know maybe, but uh, how much is a venti chai tea latte? Four oh five, four dollars and five cents, you know. I could never give up my chai tea latte for Jesus. I got to have it. So what I'm getting at is everybody could do something if you wanted to. And I'm encouraging you, if you want to follow Jesus in this one way, just say, I'm going to trust God for this. I will give this. The other thing I would like to say is don't discount yourself. Well, all I could, you know, I'm believing God could give through me you know, 50 cents a month. Well, great. If that's your faith in God, then give it. But don't say, my 50 cents doesn't count. Because that's why God called us together, because everybody counts. It all matters. It all matters. Have you read uh, Jesus' stories? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And He said, it says, Jesus one day was sitting at the temple treasury watching the people give isn't that fun he's sitting there watching and he says a widow came up it says in this is mark 12 and luke uh, 21 it says a widow came up and she gave two small coins and jesus was watching and he turned to his disciples he said hey guys did you see that this this widow lady who gave the last she gave two coins It was more than all of the rich people combined because she gave out of 
what she had. So your two coins count two. Does that make sense? Don't go, well, I'm not giving because you're going to give a lot. I can't give much. Everybody counts because together we make a difference. And you have no idea. So uh, please take out one of these in just a moment. And Deanna, if you'll come to the piano. And, uh, and I want to pray and say, have I explained this well, Ryan? Zoe, you got it? Understand? Does it sound good? I mean, I don't want to confuse anybody. You're giving through the years, and we invite some of you to join us for the very first time. Giving for Jesus to send others has changed the world. We together partner with others, and it changes the world. This side of that world we sang about where there'll be no more pain, we will rise, no more suffering. It'll be a new day. When we, then we'll figure it all out the impact that your life had past, present, forward but you are making a difference because you deny yourself you give up and you take up your cross and you follow Jesus and some of you it's a little spark even to give today even to express that you will trust God to give through you it'll be a little spark in a reconnecting we don't give because God needs our money. We give because we need Jesus in the center of our lives. We give because we want to follow him. And we give because people all around the world need to know Jesus, who made them, who loves them. I had a couple stories I was going to end with. So that's the reason I'm pausing for a minute. Also, uh, to give you a chance to join in and fill that out. We'll pray in just a minute. For about 15 years, we sent an offering to one Dick Foth. Dick was a speaker here the first week of December of this past year. And uh, we supported... Dick and Ruth Foth, I think it was $200 a month. They continue to serve. Uh, they're now on a staff of a church in Colorado, but they continue to serve in Washington, D.C. This past week, we received just a short report from Dick and Ruth Foth. Now, picture yourself in the report. Picture yourself as making a difference. Because uh, not only are you reaching people, a young couple, in a Muslim village on the other side of the planet, you're reaching people even in Washington, D.C. because of your friendship through Christ with other people. Dick and Ruth Foth write, 60 years is a long time to do anything. But Thursday, February 2nd, 2012, was the 60th National Prayer Breakfast in Washington, D.C. Dick Foth was there with several community leaders. The breakfast is the result of the dreams of one man. Abraham Veraday. Abraham emigrated from Norway. Why did they let a Norwegian come into the country? Abraham emigrated from Norway to Butte, Montana in the early 1900s. He became a circuit-riding Methodist preacher with a great heart for the poor. That heart took him to Seattle, Washington and during the Great Depression. In working with the poor, he discovered that to really affect the culture, he needed to get the ear of someone in the halls of power. So he began meeting with a handful of Seattle businessmen. They met each 
week to eat breakfast, share some thoughts from Jesus, and to pray together. Ultimately, the mayor of Seattle was invited to join them, and from that came the first mayor's prayer breakfast in 1936. Abraham Veraday became associated with Goodwill Industries. He traveled, took him across the United States into Europe. Wherever he went, small gatherings of leaders and prayer breakfasts seemed to follow. In 1942, he came to Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. Can there be anybody in Washington that knows Jesus? It's a joke. I'm teasing. And by 1946, there were private groups in the Senate and the House that met weekly, and those groups still meet today around the person of Jesus. <clears throat> After President Eisenhower was elected to presidency in 1952, the Senate and House groups decided to honor the first family of the United States with a breakfast similar to the Seattle Mayor's Breakfast. It was 200 men in the Mayflower Hotel on Connecticut Avenue. Since that time, 1952, the breakfast has served men and women and international guests. This year, 2012, there were 3,400 guests from 150 nations. No president since Eisenhower has missed attending the breakfast. The National Prayer Breakfast is perhaps the most unique event that we have been a part of. The range of people, nations, and agendas is mind-boggling, and in the midst of it all, Jesus is lifted up. It's not an evangelistic outreach as such, but rather more a breakfast at Levi's house. The story in Matthew 9 details Jesus inviting a tax collector to follow him. A full-fledged member of the IRS, come follow Jesus. And in turn, the tax collector invites Jesus to dinner, and as usual, Jesus is criticized for the folks with whom he identifies, and he responds by saying that he didn't come to help righteous people, but sick people. In short, the breakfast, the National Prayer Breakfast, is a collection of people from every possible background who would not necessarily be classified as religious, but who appreciate the relationships around the table and the simple and candid way in which Jesus is presented. As a result, after each breakfast, National Prayer Breakfast, numbers of people decide to follow Jesus. And scores of conversations are started that allow for engagement around Jesus. We've been amazed over these past 20 years at the impact of one Abraham Veraday and his dream. Thank you for your part in it. So you have no idea what's going on through your life when we band together around the person of Jesus. Would you stand with me? And we're going to sing, and as we do, I want to invite you that are willing to come forward and put your offering or your faith promise, what you're believing God for to do in your life, I want you to put it on this table in the front. It's an act of worship. The first place we have worship is uh, mentioned, the word worship in the Bible is Genesis chapter 22. And that's where we get the idea of an altar, because... Uh, God said to Abraham, why don't you put Isaac on the altar? You, you need to give him to me. Oh. So he built an altar and he put his son Isaac on the altar. So this is a little expression. We're, we're, not, we're not putting Isaac, our son, on the altar. But we're going to put a little expression of our faith in God. And everybody matters. Now, if you want to, uh, I, I'm encouraging you, if you can, if you're able to make the steps and come down here and do it, your expression of faith encourages the faith of other people. But if you're not able to get down here in just a minute, we'll pass the offering bag around and you can put it in there. Does that make sense? But uh, sing as you know the song. Uh, say, as God would provide. Now, some of you, it's pretty difficult financially. What would you believe God could do through you? Don't underestimate what God can do through you. Our Father in heaven, as we express on this Sunday morning a real connection in this world's life with an understanding that you really are the one who is in the middle of this life, I pray that your hand, your spirit would be upon each one of us. I pray that you would bless each one 
regardless of where they are, regardless of what they are thinking or where they might be living in this hour, that you are a God who loves them and that love was revealed through the person of Jesus. And Jesus is the one that we want to lift up. That if we seek to save our life, we will lose it. But if we will lose our life for you, Jesus, and for your good news, that everyone matters and everyone is wanted by you and everybody can accept you, that we will find true life. And in this giving today, through a simple expression of faith and giving of money through these next few months into another year, dear God, may the kingdom of heaven be strengthened. May the glory of God be revealed in our lives individually and in our lives as a church and may we recognize that we are making a difference around the globe. We love you, Lord. Amen.